This is a session on genetic engineering vaccines, implants, and soft biomaterials. And you're not going to learn about that from me. We have a couple of uh, <laughs> professors here in the, in the Zoom meeting with us. And uh, I will let them introduce themselves here in just a minute. Um, we will probably at different times here throughout use the chat function. So feel free um, in Zoom if you're prompted. You can um, put some answers to, to questions in there. If you do have any questions, feel free to put them in there and we will try to address those, whether it's uh, kind of during the session, a little bit afterwards. Um, things you can also unmute yourself or unmute your video and, and say hi that way and, and ask a question. Um, again, kind of either during the presentation or at the end, we'll leave a little bit of time for question and answer. Um, we are recording the session, but uh, um, you can still still act normally there. And uh, at the end, there's a good chance we'll stop that recording if, uh, if anyone is a little too shy to ask any questions while that's going, and you'll be able to ask some after that is done. Um, so at this point, I'm gonna, get, gonna turn it over to our presenters, um, our couple of professors, and I will let them introduce themselves. Brandon, if you wanna go first. Sure. Uh, I'm, I'm Brandon Vogel. I'm a professor in chemical engineering. I'm going to talk about biomaterials uh, in the last half of this hour session. And I'm Edith Muscula. I'm a professor in chemical engineering as well. And I'll be talking about genetic engineering in the first half of the session. I apologize that my video is off. I'm having some webcam issues. But I do look like my picture most of the time. <laughs> The life of the virtual engineering, <laughs> some some technical exactly. issues and things. And um, one thing I did want to say earlier is I wish we all could be in person. Unfortunately, we can't be, um, but we're glad everyone's able to join us virtually here. So uh, looking forward to, to to learning some things here. Should we get started? Yep, go right ahead. All right, let's see if hopefully my issues are limited to just the webcam. Can you see my screen? Fantastic. All right. So as mentioned, I'm going to be talking about genetic engineering and broadly taking the view of how we humans or homo sapiens have been essentially manipulating nature throughout history. And I want to start with some context to this. And I have a question. Please feel free to use that chat box. Uh, when did humans first began manipulating the genes of other organisms. When did we start trying to exert control over the, the life forms around us? All right, we've got one stab at an answer. Do we have any other thoughts? A while ago, I like the specificity. <laughs> Ooh, we're we're getting warmer here. Yes, so arguably, uh, some will tell you that we started genetically manipulating organisms in approximately 11,000 BCE, which was the start of agriculture. What would you think drove humans to start farming, develop agriculture? More food? Why would they care about more food? Ooh, it's like You've, you've already heard my question before I even asked it. Exactly. So with these rising populations, uh, it is thought that overcrowding and rising populations are what drove the rise of agriculture. How did humans live before agriculture? Exactly. We had a hunter-gatherer society before that. I'm a big fan of this of comics. So this is hopefully for your amusement, but also mostly for my amusement. And these hunter-gatherer societies, once they achieved a certain population, weren't able to be very sustainable in, in that form anymore. And it's thought that that really was a driving force in 
the start of agriculture because it was more stable as, as a food source. Where did agriculture first arise? Yes, so the cradle of civilization, also known as Mesopotamia, this represents modern day Turkey, Syria, and Iraq. And anyone know what the first crops and animals that were domesticated are? Any guesses? Yes, exactly. So wheat was among the first, as well as various legumes like lentils. And then actually in Eastern Asia around the same time, it's believed that certain livestock such as sheep were also domesticated around, again, around the same time span. What do you think drove what got domesticated in those early days? Why was it that wheat got domesticated and maybe something else didn't? What was around the area, yeah. What grew well? So we've seen a couple answers that actually got at uh, some of the big driving forces. And this is where we get into a little bit of genetics. So plant domestication in particular was controlled and driven by traits being monogenic. A monogenic trait refers to a trait that is controlled by a single gene uh, as opposed to polygenic where multiple genes interact to control the trait. So as you can imagine, a monogenic trait is much, much easier to control for. And the crops that we were able to successfully domesticate in the early days were things that had features that were favorable and controlled by a monogenic trait. So to give an example of what this looked like, we see in this picture, wheat and do all these stalks of wheat look the same not really right the left and the right have a big difference if you are harvesting wheat what do you think you prefer the far right and the far right is what we think of often in modern times when we think of the wheat and you see these beautiful clusters. The wheat is all clustered right up at the top. And the reason that's desirable is because it's so much easier to harvest. If you imagine picking off these single pieces of wheat from the left, that's much more labor intensive, much less efficient compared to the right, where you can go through with a single swoop and harvest all of this beautiful wheat. And to our luck, uh, for, for early humans, this was a monogenic trait. So to contrast this uh, with other things, how many people have had an almond? Anyone eat almonds ever? Barring allergies? All right, we got some almond eaters. Has anyone eaten an acorn? <laughs> some of you tried, oh my goodness. Uh, so acorns, for those of you who've tried them, probably tasted pretty bitter. They should taste pretty bitter. Acorns and almonds naturally have very similar toxic compounds, but in almonds, this compound is governed by a monogenic trait, whereas in acorns, it's a polygenic. And for that reason, we have domesticated almonds, but have not domesticated acorns. We leave those for the squirrel. Kind of moving forward, I want to make some quick stops in the, in the history of the field before we get to kind of what is going on in genetic engineering today. So thinking about history, you know, 11,000 BCE, we have the domestication of plants and animals. And then it wasn't until the 1600s that advances in microscopy and our understanding of plant reproduction began. And we could start studying this as, a, as more of a science as we know it. In the mid 1700s was when modern day animal husbandry began, which is the cattle breeding that you may be familiar with today as a source of food. And what the early efforts in genetic manipulation looked like was what's known as selective breeding, where you picked parents, whether they were plants or animals, 
of desirable traits and you tried to ensure that those plants or animals bred and hopefully got a next generation that also had those desirable traits. Moving forward, in 1866, Gregor Mendel published works on pea plants. How many people have heard of Gregor Mendel? He's known as the father of, of modern genetics. All right. Great to see. Uh, but it was not until 1900 that his work became recognized. And it was in the 1900s that genetics became really a field. It wasn't until 1953 that the double helix structure of DNA was identified. Any one know who identified that, who's given the credit? I'm gonna ask more questions than I even intended to because y'all are doing so well. Yes, Watson and Crick, anyone know whom else? And that lady's name was Rosalind Franklin. Yes, exactly. So Rosalind Franklin is credited for taking the picture that led to the identification of DNA's double helix structure, but she was not given the wide credit at the time that uh, she has deserved. We're, we're working on making up for that in the modern times. So in, oops, that was wrong. All right, here we go. Uh, in 1977 is when genetic engineering really started to take off. Rat insulin was the first um, drug produced in bacteria. And in 1978, shortly thereafter, human insulin was produced in bacteria. In 1987, scientists first absorb, observed the cluster DNA repeats that would come to be known as CRISPR. How many people have heard of CRISPR? All right, so CRISPR is a really hot genetic engineering technology right now. Yes, CRISPR-Cas9, exactly. Uh, CRISPR stands for Clustered Regularly Interspersed Palindromic Repeats, and it's actually part of a bacterial defense mechanism. What that looks like is in this slide here, the gray pieces are these palindromes. These are pieces of DNA sequence that read the same from left to right or right to left, and they are regularly interspersed among these pieces of more unique DNA fragments. Those are the, the non-gray pieces that are listed as spacers. More recently, in the last decade, scientists realized that these spacers are actually bits of um, viral DNA that the bacteria has chopped from a, a virus it's come into contact with and stored to be able to later use it almost like a photo album um, to, to check for future infections and say, oh, I've seen this virus before. I know that this is the pathogen I wanna protect myself against. And this system works with Cas9, as mentioned by Eddie. Uh, Cas9 is essentially a pair of molecular scissors and it's really exciting because it has a really high degree of specificity for where it can cut DNA, and it's also been exploited in a few other ways to, to cut and paste DNA. Uh, CRISPR is a lot cheaper and faster and more efficient than what was previously the prevalent mode of um, genetic engineering, though it's still not uh, the, the only mode that we use for genetic engineering. Moving forward to some really recent advances, I guess maybe 1996 doesn't feel recent to everybody, so I should take that back. But in 1996, Dolly the sheep was the first mammal cloned. How many people have heard of Dolly? All right, great. So she was cloned using a, a technique called somatic cell nuclear transfer. And in 2018, just two years ago, uh, the first primates were cloned using this same technology, and these were macaw monkeys. And I've got a picture of them because I think I mean, they are pretty cute. Uh, and this was a huge, huge step in genetic engineering. And just recently in 2020, genes edited directly in a patient, actually in the patient's body, uh, was accomplished with the CRISPR-Cas9 system, which is a, another huge, huge milestone in the field. 
So that was really a, a high level kind of run through 13,000 years of humans manipulating nature. And what I want to do is use the rest of the couple of minutes that we have together to get some of your thoughts on genetic engineering as a field and its implications and its uses. Yeah, so why do we want to clone things? Does anyone have a, a thought as to why we want to clone things? Organ transplants is a reason for cloning things. Um, yes having some kind of control over characteristics, help combating disease, those are all potential motivators to clone things. There's also testing for vaccines, so being able to use clones for tests. And we're starting to, to kind of dive into, someone mentioned the ethics war. Um, if you're using clones to test for vaccines, for example, are you thinking of these clones as animal clones, human clones? Does it matter? What are some of the dangers that might be associated with cloning on a mass scale? Mutation, is everyone familiar with the concept of mutation when genes are essentially, they, they go awry, something happens that wasn't meant to happen? Reduced biodiversity, why is reduced biodiversity an issue? The gene pool is limited with, you know, we need, why do we need a large gene pool? Anyone familiar with, for example, the potato famine uh, of Ireland? Yes, more susceptible to disease, exactly. So this is actually something that is plaguing the world banana crop right now the banana that's found at most grocery stores is called the Cavendish banana and it is yep it is being uh, taken over by the Panama fungus uh, which is actually a cousin of the virus that took over the previous banana crop the Cavendish banana has only been around for about 60 years eh, maybe 70 years at this point uh, but in the in the 50s there was a different banana that succumbed to this the same disease and essentially became wiped out, which is a similar risk that we run against uh, with any type of loss of biodiversity. And I saw, I think there was a question about, um, there was a question, a question related to COVID-19 I saw earlier that I'm trying to scroll up to get back to. I think that question was if you could clone antibodies for COVID-19. Yeah, so you could. Um, so there's actually two ways that people use the term cloning in, in genetic engineering. So one is to create a full replica, and then it's also used on a smaller scale when you clone a gene into another organism to create a, a protein. And theoretically, you could, you could use uh, molecular cloning, which I can actually show you 
here uh, where you cut and paste a gene that, that creates a protein into a cell, usually a bacterial cell, and that bacterial cell produces that protein in large quantities. Uh, and then that's kind of related to how are things cloned after we map the DNA? So when we're talking about large scale cloning, like the cloning of the uh, macaw monkeys, what they actually did was they worked at the level of uh, the egg cell of the uh, macaw and they removed the DNA from the early initial egg cell that they had and they put in the DNA of the monkey clone they wanted to create. If that makes sense. And then they, they implanted that new egg into a surrogate macaw monkey who then carried uh, the, the baby to, to term. And they used quite a few macaws. It wasn't necessarily successful with each attempt, uh, but they did achieve the, the end result of, of two healthy born macaws after a few rounds of, of trial. So we're actually out of my allotted time, uh, but if you have any questions, you can always reach out. Uh, maybe we'll have some time at the end. And I'll just take this last question. So uh, success in making a clone, if we're talking about a, a mass scale clone, or sorry, a full scale clone of, of an organism would be, um, do you have a viable or, or a living organism that's produced and does its DNA match, match the original intended? On a smaller scale, like what I have in the picture that's actually still up, it's more, is your bacterial cell producing the, the protein that you've cloned into it? And I'll, I'll end there to give Professor Vogel his, his full time. But again, if you have any further questions, please don't hesitate to, to reach out to me. I always enjoy talking about genetic engineering. I, I teach a class on it and sometimes I talk too much. So. <laughs> All right, great. I'm going to switch over and share my screen here. Can everybody see my screen? Yeah. All right. In my chat window ready. All right. So for my session, uh, I'm, I'm Professor Vogel, uh, as mentioned earlier, I teach chemical engineering. Uh, one of the electives that I teach at Bucknell is biomaterials. And so it's a 14 week course. We're going to try and uh, put 14 weeks into 22 minutes. And so uh, we'll see how successful we are. <laughs> All right. Uh, before we get into the, the meat of the material, I wanted to do a little exercise. And so in the chat window, can you tell me uh, or list uh, a, a biomaterial that has ever been by you, uh, used by you or someone you know? Um, note, I know that you may not know what biomaterials are, uh, but I'd like you to think about what the word means and then kind of make an educated guess. You've now had Professor Meinert and Dean Mather and Professor Wakabayashi, and they've kind of talked about materials as well, and, and I think Professor Raymond. And so you should have some background in materials. Uh, and, and so let's, let's uh, see if we can focus ourselves around biomaterials. So let's uh, fire away. Yeah, pacemaker, yep. Pacemaker is a good example of one, yep. Anything else? Teeth fillings, yep. Teeth fillings would be contact lenses. Yeah, well, you, you're, uh, you're very on this. Glasses, uh, glasses, yeah, they, they, they might be. Uh, uh, screws and surgery, yep, absolutely. Prosthetics, stents for the heart, amputations. Uh, well, amputations is actually removing uh, part of the body. Food, um, food's not, uh, not meant to be a, a biomaterial. 
surgical twine, heart valve, stitches, uh, magnifier, probably not. Um, unless you consider contact lenses as a magnifier. All right, is everybody kind of seeing a theme about what I'm saying uh, seemingly is a biomaterial versus not? All right, so let's go and look at, at what the actual definition is. Uh, why is it not moving forward? There we go. All right, so there's actually several definitions. Uh, vaccine, that's an interesting one. Um, the medicine that's in it uh, would be made, it might be genetically engineered like Professor uh, Miskiolo just mentioned. Um, but the, the biomaterial portion of it might be how you get it into the body. Uh, and, and we'll talk a little bit um, more potentially about this later, right? But, um, and so it would be the method that you introduce it into the body. All right, so there's actually several definitions for a biomaterial. Uh, the first one is, I'm going to say it's, well, let me ask you a question. Do you think biomaterials existed before 19, before World War II? All right, I'm seeing lots of yays and yeses, a couple of no's. And so this, this definition uh, pertained to basically before 1995. All right, so biomaterial is a non-viable material used in a medical device intended to interact with biological systems. All right, this kind of makes sense. Uh, around 1995, some medical doctors and engineers got together and they devised a way to take cells from a patient, uh, culture them up, and then re-implant uh, them, and then try and regrow body parts. Um, notice in this definition, uh, what does the word non-viable mean? So non means not. So what is, in this, not alive, that's right, not alive. So viable in this context means living, uh, whether it's living or not. So this is, so I would consider trying to replace a body part within somebody as a biomaterial. This definition doesn't count. So uh, they had to go and change what the definition was. So the newer definition is that it's a material intended to interface with biological systems to evaluate, treat, augment, or replace tissue organ or function of the body, right? So that's much more broad and it encompasses living materials and not living materials. And if you look at the word biomaterial, what does bio mean? It means living, right? Living material, basically. Or, and it's really about how it's interfacing with the body. Uh, so there's a question, in its most basic sense, would a Band-Aid be a biomaterial? Well, it definitely augments and helps um, your body uh, repair. It's really keeping kind of uh, moisture in and bacteria and other things out. And so I would say uh, the, the better case for a Band-Aid being a biomaterial are the hydrogel Band-Aids, the ones that are kind of squishy meant for uh, kind of burns. Uh, okay, so in the chat window, tell me which of the following are biomaterials. So I have uh, pictures of a contact lens, a splinter, a vascular graft, uh, and crutches. Well, a pirate hook wouldn't, uh, wouldn't really count as a, a biomaterial in that instance. All right, so I'm seeing answers here. I see contact lenses. Uh, so I see one and three, which would be contact lenses and vascular graphs. Um, yeah, so I, I think that um, contact lenses are, uh, they, they, see they fit that definition, right? So they're interacting with the body. They're augmenting your ability to see. Um, what about the splinter? That's interacting with your body. Why, why wouldn't that, um, why wouldn't that count? Yeah, it's not, it's not really meant to be there. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not, it doesn't have an intended use. It's not uh, helping to do something, right? Uh, the next picture is a vascular graft. Anybody know what a vascular graft is? So if you have a wound on your body or you have a clogged artery or something and you need to repair, repair part of your vasculature, your, your circulatory system, um, if they can't take it from somewhere else, they need to find some vasculature. And, and so one option is to actually implant these grafts in. So that they would do is take out the section that is maybe blocked or has been damaged and then they would sew these in and then the, it would kind of incorporate itself into the, the blood uh, vasculature and allow blood flow through them. 
And so, um, so these are obviously biomaterials and they're typically made out of things like expanded polytetrafluoroethylene, which is the same type of material that you put on nonstick pans, uh, otherwise known as Teflon. All right, uh, and then, okay, so the, the more controversial one is uh, crutches. Do people consider crutches to be biomaterials? I see one answer is no. I see a lot of no's. So when I teach this course, you know, I, I always say, uh, uh, I would give credit for this answer as a yes, if you can, if you can argue it. Um, because you think about it, it is interacting with your body, right? And it's augmenting your ability to walk or helping you walk. And, and so, but it, you know, the real question is how much is it augmenting with your body? It's not a lot. And, and so I would usually consider the answer to be no. All right, so this is an older picture from 1985. Uh, what strikes you about this image, other than it looks kind of old? So what, what pops out to me here is um, everything is synthetic. So we have uh, like leg prosthetics, we have an arm, we have an artificial heart, we have a uh, hearing implant, we have craniomaxiofacial uh, pieces so for your nose and in your mouth and in places, knee implants. Um, notice, notice none of it is living, right? And so this is, this is a good example of, of a transition we're going to see um, from materials that are just meant to kind of augment uh, people's ability or help them out uh, to basically materials that can replace um, living tissue, all right? All right, so uh, what would you consider or what should we consider when designing a biomaterial? What are things that you think might be important? Uh, the way the body reacts, great. It's safety, how useful it is. Uh, the effect on the body, durability, great. Yep, these are all important things. How, in, how it interacts chemically with the body, yep. Absolutely. You could imagine if you put something into the body and there was a chemical reaction that happened, um, or the immune system came over and said, this shouldn't be here, um, your body may want to try and get rid of it or do something to, to have an adverse reaction. And so we want to try and avoid that. Um, fewer side effects, yep, the size and the shape of it, these are all great, great suggestions, yep. All right, some other things to consider here. Um, intended use, unintended consequences. And so the, the mantra of a doctor, their Hippocratic Oath, is, is do no harm. And so they're putting uh, things into the body or doing surgery to try and repair and help people. Uh, but one thing, when you start to put materials in the body, you may not know longer term how they're going to actually affect the human. And so one example is actually what's called stress shielding. And uh, there's an example here. You see this is um, an artificial hip that's been implanted. And notice the hip is broken. This could have been a mechanical failure, or a, a material failure, uh, but more uh, an, an, another option that can happen during this process is something called stress shielding. And, and so because the metal is so, has better mechanical properties than bone and the shape of it uh, is, is um, it basically causes the forces in the body, going through the body to not actually go through the feet anymore and, and actually causes them to go, the forces to go closer to the upper thigh and what that can do is actually remodel the bone and the bone can, be, can become very weak and actually break. And, and so that's what we would call, you know, they're, they're meaning good because they're trying to repair the broken hip. But in fact, um, longer term, they've actually caused another problem that they didn't realize would happen. All right. And so another issue that can happen is uh, the lifetime versus cost benefit. So biomaterials typically cost a lot of money. Uh, and nothing is reusable. So an artificial knee, for instance, um, the older ones typically would only last 10, 10 to 12 years before they had to come out and you had to put a new one in. Insurance, by the way, will only pay for two uh, artificial knees over a lifetime. All right. And, and so uh, also injury recovery benefit. Um, at, at what point does somebody become too old to put a biomaterial into the body? This is a real question. You know, is it appropriate to put a biomaterial into a 102-year-old? 
Um, I would say probably not because the person, depending upon the biomaterial, they may not survive the surgery. They may not be able to actually do the physical therapy to have a quality of life. And so people have to make these distinctions as well. And then finally, the, the medical significance, what's the potential benefit? You know, you are going to be potentially opening somebody up doing major surgery. Is it going to provide enough benefit uh, for all the cost? Um, oops. There we go. Oops. Uh, all right. So what are some important topics integral to biomaterials? Uh, and, and you mentioned some of these uh, in your previous set of um, comments. Um, things like, so this picture here up in the upper left-hand corner, um, this is actually a, a, a section of tissue that has had microparticles put in it. And the microparticles, I think, are made out of ceramic. Um, and, and so you can see where the, where the ceramic or the microparticles were. Um, so it's important in order, if you want to study biomaterials, you need to know something about the functional tissue structure, right? What should be, what, there, what shouldn't be there and, and how the cells are composed and toxicity. Uh, but other important factors are things like, uh, obviously material science, knowing what materials there are. Um, and if you look at the, the picture on the, the bottom, uh, we have a bone implant tissue interface. So knowing something about um, the native tissue structure and then the mechanical properties required for replacing that tissue. And, and so it goes, just be, it goes beyond just biology or just material science. So biomaterials is inherently a multidisciplinary field where you have all these people who need to work together to be able to, to work uh, on these problems. All right, so... Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the history of biomaterials because it's been around for so long. Sutures have been around for more than 32,000 years, right? The Romans, Chinese, and Aztecs used gold and dentistry more than 2,000 years ago. Things like ivory, gemstones, wood. You think about it, your teeth, uh, you break a tooth, uh, you know, you need to basically put something in there to continue eating. Uh, glasses and wooden teeth have also been around for much of recorded history. In this picture up on the upper left, you or upper right rather, you can see um, a, a woman being fitted for a glass eye and all of the different options they had. In 1759, there are, there are records of wooden peg and twisted thread being able to use to unite the edges of the brachial artery, which runs along the knee. Um, and no, notice at this time, or you should know, that there's no pain medication uh, and there's, there's nothing about aseptic technique or knowing about bacteria. And so, there, so over 50% of people die just from bacterial infections. Uh, and, and so this is a, a really difficult time. Um, I wanted to point out this, this person called, uh, his name's Ambois Paré, and he's the father of modern battlefield surgery. And he developed a whole bunch of different instruments, as well as ideas and design concepts for uh, the prosthetic leg, hands, arms, all different parts. And this is from 1564, to give you an idea, which is pretty remarkable. Now, you can look at some of these tools that they use on the battlefield. Uh, that they are they're rather crude looking. And again, they're not sterilizing any of these things at all. They're just trying to, to do things. And, and this, this is an important point here because throughout history, it's been the hero doctors who want to try and uh, help the patient survive the battlefield that have developed a lot of the innovations uh, related to biomaterials. Contact lenses, the concept was developed by Da Vinci. Uh, Fick, who is in, important in chemical engineering for developing a lot of the understanding about diffusion. He actually invented the glass contact lens in the 1880s. Um, it, during that time, when they would first put them in, in the 1880s, uh, they actually had to, to use cocaine in order to handle the pain, uh, because it, and they could only have them in for minutes at a time. By the 1930s, they had figured out how to grind glass down, and you could hold them in your eyes for 12 hours. Um, another example of how war has impacted biomaterials is uh, during World War II, uh, fighter pilots would, would be in dogfights and they'd have their airplanes would be strifed with, uh, with um, ammunition and it would sometimes shatter the cockpit. And one example, a, 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 a fighter pilot had come back home and was seeing his, his um, doctor and they noticed something was in his eye and it was a piece of uh, this, this cockpit. And what the doctor had discovered was that there was no inflammation, no nothing bad around the person's eye. And so uh, the person went and, and ordered, he, he said, we should design contact lenses or intraocular lenses, things you implant 
out of these. So he, he had eleven hundred made uh, as a trial run, and so and that's actually what they continue to use today. And this happened in about the fifties or sixties. Um, so PMMA doesn't make great contact lenses. Uh, it's good for intraocular lenses. Contact lenses are made of, out of more things like silicones. So what are used today? Well, for skeletal systems, you need something mechanically robust. So we have things like titanium or ceramics uh, for bone cements. In the cardiovascular system, we need things that are more flexible and able to kind of pump. And so those might be things like polyurethanes or silicones. Uh, and then if you look at that kind of shiny picture with the red on it, that's Dacron, which is a, a polyester, and that's used for a, a basically a vascular graft. Uh, and then uh, things like contact lenses are made out of silicones because they're breathable. Um, they allow oxygen to transport because your eye needs to breathe. All right, so I want to talk about a couple of examples of how biomaterials are used today. And in these examples, uh, there may be uh, some pictures of an organ or some blood or surgeries. I'll try and give you a warning out ahead of time. This next picture will have a picture of, of an organ. And so there's no blood or anything. It's just, uh, just some tissue. All right, so adhesions. So when, uh, when somebody has their body cavity opened up and they're getting surgery done, um, unless the surgical technique is meticulous and perfect, uh, during the healing process, the immune system can come in and actually create a cascade of events that relate to what are, are, are that relay into what are called adhesions. And adhesions are basically fibrous tissue that connect an organ uh, to an internal part of the body. And so that's what you see in the picture on the left. Um, so those aren't supposed to be connected. And so what has to happen is then the doctor has to go back in. They have to do surgery again to remove the adhesion. All right. And so I'm going to show you an example of that surgery now there is a little bit of blood there might be a little bit of blood um, so if, if you feel squeamish you might want to look away all right so uh, notice the doctor's uh, hands aren't in there and so they have these little clamps or these these things that are, that are cutting tools that can pull on the tissue and they're basically removing uh, one portion of the tissue from the other by basically cutting the the um, adhesions all right, and so what I wanted to point out as well is this is actually a robotic surgery. So the, the doctor is in effect playing a video game. They're looking on a screen, they have these probes inside the human, and they're using an equivalent of a joystick to basically do these surgeries, uh, which leads to better patient outcomes and less invasiveness. All right, so what are some non-surgical solutions? Um, so things like in the history, uh, animal membranes like cat gut have been used, gold foil, Mineral oil has been pl uh, placed around the, the body, silk, rubber, Teflon, even amniotic membranes. My favorite though is one, there's one archaic method um, where they actually have the, the patient ingest iron filings and then the, the nurse would actually then move a large magnet on the patient's body and try and keep the organs moving around. These are all kind of silly. Uh, so, so some doctors and, and engineers, material scientists came up with an idea, why not use the equivalent of saran wrap? and just wrap the organ in saran wrap. And if the saran wrap is degradable, then you don't have to worry about it. And, and so here's another surgery, uh, and that's exactly what happens. Uh, and so this is the equivalent of the saran wrap here. This is a degradable membrane, and this membrane goes away after 14 days. And so you get a sense they just put it in place, and then they just close them up. All right, I wanna talk a little bit about tissue insuring because this is important in the field. And it's really where the cut, a lot of the cutting edge is happening. So how do you engineer a living tissue? Well, you take uh, cells from the donor patient, you isolate them, you culture them up, you put them in a scaffold, something that can hold them in a three-dimensional space so they can grow together and see and feel each other. And then you take that mass of tissue that's formed outside the body and plant it back in. And then hopefully your body takes over the healing process. All right, there's another uh, video I'm gonna show you that has um, kind of a disturbing image. There's no blood or anything. Uh, so on the left, you see two different types of tissue engineering scaffold. Uh, this one in, that's kind of lighter in color, uh, that's actually made through what's called salt leaching. So you take a plastic, you dissolve it in a solvent, you put in some salt, you remove the, the solvent, um, and now you're left with a piece of plastic with salt. You put it in water and then the salt removes away. Now you have these nice little pores that cells can go in and be cultured. 
Okay, so what are some applications? So this is uh, an important video. Attached a human ear onto the back of a mouse. The ethics are controversial. Though many believe this is horrifically cruel to the animal, others see an amazing breakthrough that could save lives. How was such a feat accomplished? It's the brainchild of doctors and brothers Charles and Joseph Bacotti and a team of researchers at Massachusetts General Hospital. Scientists initially believed it was impossible to graft and grow anything more complex than simple human tissue onto another living organism. That is, until now. Intricate and highly developed, an ear is the most difficult cartilaginous tissue to reconstruct. All right, so how do people feel about that? Do the people feel it's ethical to put an ear on the back of a mouse? What do we think in the chat? Uh, I'll point out these mice have actually been genetically engineered. Notice how they have no hair. Uh, they've, been, they've been genetically engineered to basically have no hair and have no immune system because they're putting uh, human cells into a mouse. And if they had an immune system, the, the mouse, uh, their immune system would fight that implant. Um, is the mouse being harmed by it? Well, I mean, uh, you could argue that having an ear on your back that's roughly, you know, a third of the size of you could be harming the, the mouse. I don't know that it hurts the mouse, but it certainly uh, doesn't feel comfortable. So this is one of the important aspects. I'm not a big fan, this was one of the comments. This is one of the important aspects of biomaterials. Uh, there are, just like genetic engineering, there's a lot of ethical questions that go along with these. Um, you have to make choices based on your professional um, expertise uh, about whether something is appropriate in harming the animals. And, and so I think most people think this is okay, uh, but it's, it's kind of bordering on the line of, of, um, of not ethical. This, is, this was a big breakthrough at the time. Okay, so what's the future? I showed you something from 1995. This is from a couple of years I'm ago. I'm Dr. Benasser, and my lab makes ears. The invention that we've uh, discovered is a way to uh, print living cells in a material uh, that can uh, be used to reconstruct tissues in the body. My laboratory is interested in regenerating cartilage wherever it's found in the body. The process starts with a scan of an ear. You sit someone down in a in a chair and we have a camera that spins around their head and takes a 3D image of their, of their head. Then can very precisely map out the topology of the ear. The next kind of key step is developing the ink for this printer. This ink is actually a living ink. It contains living cells. It's alive when we put it into the printer. It's alive when it comes out of the printer. The real power of the printing technique is that it can be used to make geometries that you just can't make with any other technique. You can make parts with holes in them. We can layer and, and cover and, and put different uh, cells next to each other to create really the complex organs that make up our bodies. And after two months in an incubator, the tissue fills in and looks white, just like real cartilage. The implants that we're making um, are not rubber or, or plastic. Um, they are alive. They, they uh, grow inside the body or outside. And this has a whole host of advantages over, over conventional technology. The body accepts these materials like it's part of the body because it is. Our long-term goals are to change the way that, that uh, clinicians practice, to give them the next generation of implants that will be uh, more successful, more like real tissue that will last in the body for, for decades. All right, so there was a question as to whether um, the previous mouse, the ear was sewn on or implanted and grown. And so they, they in fact, sew it on and then um, the, the skin cells grow around and cover the, the ear, uh, the synthetic ear material. Um, and it's, this, is, uh, this notion of 3D printing, and it's not just for soft materials either. Uh, so in this case, somebody is actually, you have, has a bone defect in their jaw area and they used the 3D imaging to figure out the size and the shape of it. They 3D printed a scaffold that fits that area. They cultured cells and then put it in and, and voila, they've been able to repair somebody's bone defect. All right, so 
um, this technology is only going to get uh, more used. And it, what the nice thing about it is you can see it can be used for personalized medicine. So it can tailor things directly to your body. All right. So in summary, what have I shown you? I've shown you've gone from a time period when uh, in the 1500s, people came up and developed and actually designed iron prosthetics. Uh, and look at how different the, the 1500s versus the 1985 picture is. It's not. Right? I mean, that is fundamentally not very different. The material is a little bit different. It's a little bit lighter. But fundamentally, it's the same idea. But now, in the last 30 years, we have this concept of, hey, why not try and regrow it? Why not try and take cells and repair? And instead of putting a piece of plastic and having somebody use that to hold them up or, or provide augmentation or why not try and why don't want to try and regenerate it and so i leave you with this video here and what you see when you look at these animals there are like 12 or 13 in each group is uh he's a there's a scoring system bbb scoring system he has about a five out of 20 the way part of how you score so this this uh, mouse has had its spine uh cut and so it's a paraplegic and and so they've developed a conduit material where you can put cells in and they can basically uh, link the two ends of the spine that have been cut and then have the spine grow back together. So this is before. But if you put the implant in, and particularly if you put the implant in with cells, they do better. And they, you can actually get up to a 14 on the mean uh, which is the average of the two group. And let me just show you that, also at 100 days. And it's not a cure by any means. They're still clumsy, but he's doing much better. He is able to support his weight, and he's kind of heavy. Notice the paws are also splayed more normally. So I think that's part of the promise that biomaterials and the field of biomaterials holds moving forward. Uh, and with that, uh, that's the end of my, my talk, and I'm happy to take any questions uh, that you have. Or if you have any questions for Professor uh, Ms. Giolu, I know that she has to leave for another meeting at 2, and so if you want to get those in, I can stay a little bit longer if, if people want to talk. And I think people can, can ask those questions either in the chat or if you do want to unmute yourself, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, and I know there are just a, a couple of questions right there, but I know there was one that mentioned about the living ink. Where does the living ink come from that was in the one video? Yeah, so the living ink comes from a material like collagen and they mix it with cells and then they put it into basically a syringe that is connected to a 3D printer. And so they they program the 3D printer and it, it knows it has an XYZ uh, axis and it can basically create layers of this, this ink and then that's what they culture.